Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Charlie Nicklin. I'm Chief Executive of I Agree, and I'd like to thank you all for joining our March presentation. I'd like to welcome Dr. Nick McCarthy for our lecture today. Nick is a technical specialist at Senex, and he's focused on the development and deployment of new and emerging low carbon vehicle technologies. Nick is very much a specialist in hydrogen and electrical vehicle technologies, and will be, it'll be interesting to hear his views for agricultural equipment. As usual with our lectures, everybody is muted. If you'd like to ask questions, please pop them in the chat at the bottom of your screen. And then at the end of the presentation, we can unmute you so you can ask in person. OK, I'll now hand over to Nick. Right. So first of all, um, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you. It's, it's very much appreciated. As already introduced, I'm Nick McCarthy and I'm a specialist at Senex. Um, so I'll just outline a few of the topics that we're going to do. I'll tell you a little bit about who's about who Senex are. I'll talk about decarbonizing agriculture in general, some agri-based case studies that Senex has been involved with, excuse me. <clears throat> and then I'm going to take um, a bit of a reference to a report that we did with the Royal Agricultural Society of England, RAISE, um, the Farm of the Future report and the next steps that we've got from that. And we'll also talk a little bit about infrastructure and supply chains in general, which is relevant. And then um, I have a call to action for a new project that we're starting that hopefully some of you might be able to help with or at least have contacts that you can um, help us with. And then we'll go on to the Q&A. Um, it's fairly short. I think we've got a full hour, so we've got plenty of time for Q&A today. If you've got questions, do free, feel free to put them in the chat and we'll discuss them at the end. So first of all, who are Senex? So Senex is a research and technology organization or RTO. We've been going since 2005. Um, yeah, we're officially the name is Center of Excellence for Low Carbon and Fuel Cell Technologies, but everyone just calls us Senex these days. Um, we deliver consultancy and R&D projects um, across the broad board. We walk, work with national governments, we work with small micro um, enterprises, anybody who wants our services, we will work with them. Um, the way we, as a not-for-profit, the way it tends to work for us is we will have consultancy work, which we will hopefully make a profit on. And then that funds our research and development work, which we usually make a bit of a loss on. And when we, when we get the maths right, we're a not-for-profit company at the end of the year. Um, we also have a bunch of related companies and sister companies and collaborations and joint ventures with various other um, countries around the world. Um, and LCV Senex is being rebranded this year. It's going to be Senex Expo. And Senex Expo is Europe's largest dedicated low and zero emission transport show. Um, it's free to attend in September. Come along if you want to. So in terms of how Senex operates, um, we've broken down into three teams. The green team is our energy and infrastructure team who are very good at understanding the um, infrastructure and large scale hardware that's required to put in place new power lines, new fuel supply chains. The purple team is uh, what we call our marketing and innovation team. They're our business development team. They're also very good at understanding policy and helping to write policy for whether that's an operational policy for a single organization or a national policy, for example, I'm trying to think of an example now, um, helping Cuba develop their net zero plan is something that we did a couple of years ago. Um, and then we have the transport team, which is the blue team where I sit. So the transport team, we cover a whole wide selection of anything that moves with wheels or some things without wheels as well, actually. Um, and I tend to focus on the non-road transport side. So if it's not necessarily traveling on the motorways or the roads, it usually lands on my desk. Um, there is a significant amount of overlap with freight and logistics as well that I work on. And I have worked on taxi fleets and shared micro mobility a bit as well, because we're a small organization, about 50 people. So we lend a hand where we need. Also, perhaps of interest to you is we do host educational resources as well. So Senex is, as an RTO, I kind of describe it as being um, a university, but without students. We, we have an obligation to share our learnings and insights. So do uh, go with to our learning partners, such as FutureLearn and others, where we host um, courses. Or you can go to our insight documents and read some of the resources. We try where we are permitted to by our clients. We put as much stuff in the public domain as we possibly can. Okay, so on to the small task of decarbonizing agriculture. So depending on who you read exactly, around about 18% of global emissions come from agriculture, agriculture, forestry, and land use. Now, 
in terms of the transport um, element of that, it's right at the bottom. It's a small fraction of it. This is kind of where Senex works at the moment. So we're focusing on the non-road mobile machinery, generator sets, um, telehandlers, tractors, anything that's powered with wheels that's operating in an agricultural setting. Also including um, any transport to and from um, the farm or the food processing center. <clears throat> we're also hoping that some of our experience with automation and um, machine process control will hopefully come in helpful in some of these other sectors and we can make a contribution there. We haven't had too much work in that area yet. It's something we're keen to develop and take our expertise from other fields into an agricultural sector. Um, but yeah, we hope we could make an impact in some of these other areas as well. <clears throat> so why focus on NRMMM for global emissions in the agricultural yeah. sector. It's less than 2% of the problem, right? And the, the thing is, when we talk to people about this, everybody says they're less than 2% of the problem. You go to the air industry, you talk to an, an aircraft manufacturing company, and they go, oh, we only make private jets of 75 seat or less, we're less than 2% of the problem. Or you go to a motorcycle manufacturer and they say, we only make motorcycles between um, you know 25 and 125 cc we're less than 2% of the problem. Everybody's less than 2% of the problem. We all need to take action to help tackle climate change. As for why Senex focuses on this particular sector, it's we know net zero transport. We have been working in this sector for a long time in the freight and logistics sector, on road, passenger cars, trains, and various other sectors as well. And importantly, we have clients paying us to look at this. We're not doing this without being recompensed for the time that we put into it. We have clients who are active in this field, no pun intended, and are actively putting in place their net zero plans between now and 2050 and trying to figure out how the future is going to look. Also, I think it's worth saying, solving the transport side of emissions on the farm might actually be easier than some of the other larger CO2 emission sources. So if you can get all of your tractors and telehandlers and on-site farm vehicles and quad bikes and whatever else it might be operating at zero emissions, that 2% is taken care of. And then you can worry about some of the harder to decarbonize stuff in terms of soil management and animal management as well, in addition to that. Also, that interface, remember that you're making a product to sell to market, that interface with the logistics and wider transport system is really important. You can't work in isolation. You need to be able to produce your goods and get them off your field to your customer. And you've got to interface with the changes that the rest of society is making as well. So for all of these reasons, that's why Senex focuses on the niche, or I particularly focus on the niche of decarbonizing agricultural transport and hardware and non-road mobile machinery. So I've already alluded to the fact that Senex has worked in... Um, the sector for road transport for um, quite a while. Road transport policy is leading the way. You know, there's no doubt about it. We've all heard and read about the bans for internal combustion engines on 2030 or by 2035 for passenger cars. <clears throat> and the ban for HGVs is 2040. I think it's fair to say that we're going to see something else similar to that, a follow for non-road mobile machinery. And the pattern we tend to see is the European Union usually legislates first, then the California Air Resource Board legislates, then the rest of the US legislates, and then the rest of the world follows. And we see this trend repeatedly in emissions legislation. It's worth noting that up until now, I think this is still true, the majority, if not all, legislation on emissions control has not been about controlling CO2 emissions. It's all been about air quality emissions. It's all been about urban air quality emissions and understanding the impact of that on people's health, which is immediate and short term. But we're starting to see CO2 emissions become more and more likely to be included in legislation going forward, and that will impact all sectors. And even though it's not necessarily um, mandated to reduce CO2 emissions, we see different sectors committed to the elimination of um, as much CO2 as possible. Construction industry is definitely leading the way with electrification and hydrogenated vegetable oil, which is a HVO, a diesel replacement. Mining industry is doing it. The transport refrigeration sector is becoming increasingly electrified. We're seeing a significant market uptick 
for electric refrigeration units supported with battery systems and additional power generation on the trailer for example through solar panels on the roof or perhaps kinetic energy recovery systems connected to the brakes and the axles the maritime sector has actually committed to net zero quite recently which is a bit of a surprise to everybody and i think it's pretty clear that agriculture and forestry is going to have to go the same route i think it's inevitable that we're all going to have to commit to net zero and start having proper policies in place to make that happen so I've talked about the ban on new passenger um, ICE sales already. So ICE is internal combustion engines, as I'm sure you all know. Um, I think this slide is a bit of a repeat. It's just got some of the details written down for you of some of the stuff that I've already said. Um, I think one thing is that bottom bullet point. Every single sector is conducting trials into technology for zero emission fuels, zero emission powertrains, and reduced emission powertrains and fuels as well. And we are seeing where they become financially viable, we see a growing market share for some of these products. You know, there are already significant inroads being made in small electrical construction equipment. And we're starting to see small electric tractors hit the market as well. And I'm gonna to touch on the impact of supply chains for this later on as well. So let's just talk briefly about some of those EU regulations. So we see that EU regulations tend to go first and then the rest of the world follows is the way it's been up till now. So I'm sure you're all very familiar with the NRMM um, regulation in stage three, four, five, etc. cetera. Um, so from 2019, stage five applied and we started to see all powertrains being um, applicable within that. I won't go through all the details on this. If you want to know what the regulations say, um, DieselNet is my point of reference. I go to DieselNet, there's a reference there on the slide probably every week. And again, just to reiterate that point I was making, the EU leads the way. The EU tends to move first, but it's not just an EU thing. It's not just America. The entire world is on this trajectory down to that bottom right-hand corner, okay? And as you can see, that's projected out to 2030. This is a bit of an older graph. And a lot of people are aiming for net zero by 2050 across their economies. Um, some of them are aiming for 2060 and so forth, but everybody's heading to that bottom right corner. So let's talk a little bit about some of the work that Senex has done in this area. So the Red Diesel Replacement Program, we worked with, um, they were formerly called, the department formerly known as BAYS, now known as the Department for Energy Security and Net Zero, DESNES as we say, um, and e 4 Tech. And we were employed by them to assess and understand what impact low cost red diesel was having on the development and the adoption of technology across all sectors of non road mobile machinery, agriculture, construction, everybody. And we came to the conclusion that it, that tax rebate on diesel was stifling and limiting the adoption of less polluting technologies. Um, and we gave them that advice. We were then called back to help them come up with their research and development program to help businesses transition away from red diesel. And they fed into that argument of removing the red diesel re rebate from many of the sectors that we've talked about. As we know, agriculture did not um, have that rebate removed. I think that is probably going to happen at the next review, whatever that may be. I can't see a good reason for the agricultural sector not to have tax on diesel in an effort to encourage the uptake of more efficient fuel powertrains and alternate low and zero emission powertrains. And I think that argument is getting harder and harder to make that we should keep um, red diesel for agriculture. So you can expect that change very soon, I would, I would predict. Another case study, so this is another piece of work we did. So it's, as I mentioned earlier, we worked with Ray's and um, we did this Farm the Future report. In particular, Senex focused on Chapter 5 and a few of the white papers and the annexes that supported the document. And we, it was about understanding the future priorities and technologies, um, technologies that are in place now and how we think they're going to emerge and change over the next decade was the remit of the report. And I think we did that and we went a little bit further as well. This is a nice graphic that was produced. I think this is a very nice summary of everything that's in the report. So before you go away and go, oh, I have to read this massive report, have a look at this graph, see if there's any topics of interest to you, this graphic, and then you can decide which elements of the of the farm of the future report you want to look at. And there's a lot there, and there's some supporting material as well. 
So you can, you can read the annexes, you can read the white papers that came out with it. Um, but yeah, there's a lot to talk about. We, we, we did look at a lot of different topics. There was a lot of authors involved in that particular research. And I'll just give you an example of how we kind of did that analysis. So we started out with a literature review on the fuel consumption for various agricultural activities, and we took an international scope. Um, our argument was the UK is a tiny fraction of the global agricultural machinery market. The people who make tractors, they don't design them for the UK. They design them for the big farming economies, okay? Whether that's going to be America or Brazil or India or China or, you know, if we look closer to home, I guess Poland, France and Germany probably beat us as well, okay? Um, so we have those markets being the dominant one that we would consider when it was looking at their fuel inputs for various things. And um, we then reviewed the different strategies to assess the feasibility of different fuels, different powertrains in this agricultural context. And we developed multiple scenarios that we, at their core, they're all based on the energy content of diesel to complete an action of um, a particular type in an agricultural market. So there's a lot of different variables there. There's so many nations, so many crops, so many soil tops, types. We had to simplify to be able to do the task at all. So I defined similar tasks. So tilling, planting and plant management and harvest were the tasks that we focused on. And then we created high and low scenarios from the literature in terms of diesel use, how much energy it takes to complete those tasks. And this gives you an idea. This is kind of the starting point of how much energy we think it takes to complete some of these tasks. And then we did some additional analysis on the powertrains and the fuel supply uh, chain to get an equivalent amount of energy to achieve these tasks and what we thought that might look like. And this is kind of, you know, based largely on our direct experience of working with these technologies uh, in a road transport freight and logistics um, environment. So we have physically taken vehicles like these and we've done controlled trials of them along racetracks. We have worked with fleets of these vehicles in the logistics sector. So we took some of those knowledges on the efficiency and the, and the fuel use and we applied that to the energy demand and we turned that energy demand into a refueling demand. At the time we did this, it was, mm, is it two, three years ago now? This was based on publicly available information where we knew what manufacturers said they had available at the time, whether that was a prototype for demonstration purposes or a commercially available product. And in the three years since that was done, this information is now out of date. This field is moving very quickly. Batteries have improved. We now have a biomethane tractor available on the market. Um, Fent, I think it is, has just announced that they're in the process of developing and demonstrating a fuel cell tractor with 20 kilograms of hydrogen on it. In my original analysis, we only were aware of a one working fuel cell tractor with five kilograms of hydrogen on it. So this has moved, this field is moving very rapidly and will continue to do so. So it's something to keep an eye on. So going back to the original um, report that we did, probably you want to take the refueling table that I showed you just previously with a pinch of salt, but hopefully the base energy assessment should still be more or less right. And we have this kind of estimate of what we think it would take to do the work involved, how much energy it takes for these different power trains. Okay. Next table that I'm going to show you, I find it a bit cumbersome, but people seem to like it. So you're about to get hit with the table after this slide, which I find a bit overwhelming, but people seem to like it. So I include it in these presentations. And the key to it is um, green is um, slightly better than diesel or better than diesel. For example, blue is about the same or there may be only particular areas where it's beneficial. And then yellow is worse than diesel and red is much worse than diesel. That's generally the way we've tried to analyze this. And do bear in mind, this is a couple of years old as well. So this, so this might have changed a little bit, but hopefully not too much. And we end up with this cross-reference table. So across the top, we've got the different fuels and powertrains that we assessed. And then down the left-hand side, the different elements where we were kind of looking at it, trying to figure out, is it cheaper? Is it as effective? Can you get the job done? Does it have the torque? Is it 
Does it take more maintenance? How does this actually work in terms of comparison to an existing diesel engine? And you can cross, this gives you an idea of what we were looking at in the Ray's Farm of the Future report. Okay. So again, this slide will be available to you as part of the presentation um, that will be available for anybody who wants it on request, I'm sure. I'm happy to take this. And also this table is in the Farm of Future report already. So you can you can go straight to the original source if you so wish. Do bear in mind, technology has moved on a bit since I wrote this. I think this is all based on, I think it's 2020 data, which means it was probably published in 2019. So it gives you an idea. It's about four years ago, some of the data this is based on. Okay. So I think it's it's worth noting that net zero is possible. Okay. So in, in our system that we analyzed, battery electric vehicles, didn't work particularly well in a farming um, environment, especially for high energy intensity operations. But that that technology is improving. We've seen significant improvement. That improvement will continue over the next 10, 20, 30 years, perhaps not at the same rate as the past 10, 20 years, but it should continue to improve. I think for the low energy scenarios on a 16 hectare site, it might be possible with battery electric vehicles if batteries continue to improve and if that 16 hectare site has sufficient access to the grid to be able to recharge those batteries cost effectively. Okay. So rapid and ultra charging technologies of two or more packs per vehicle might be what's requ required a few times a year. So this means the whole battery swap technology for becomes important. Battery swap for small technology operations definitely exist ones where you can manip manipulate by hand that's a, definitely a thing there are some examples of larger battery swap technology out there as well how feasible that will be in a farming um scenario i'm less certain of like those battery swapping technologies are usually in a location where the vehicle goes to it and multiple vehicles make use of it to make it cost effective I'm not sure how you could take battery swapping to a farm and make that work, but you know, the future is yet to be written. Um, the other option that we saw was the fuel cell range extended electric vehicle. This is, you can think of this as a battery and hydrogen fuel cell hybrid. Um, that worked fairly well. You probably had to refuel it three times compared to a diesel equivalent one. But as I said, that was based on technology that was known at the time and Bent has announced that they're developing a much larger hydrogen capacity tractor. So watch this space. If they can make that happen, that might become a more feasible option in the near future, assuming that their prototype and demonstration trials go to plan. So I've talked a little bit about the impact of other markets and how you know the, the farming and agricultural sector doesn't exist in isolation. So you need to have a look at um what is going to be the best solution or what's going to be the most cost effective solution um so for example the classic example that people talk about is the efficiency of hydrogen fuel cells is like one third that of battery systems which is absolutely true and they will dismiss the hydrogen argument out of hand but they forget that you know it's no good having a battery tractor that can't that can only plow one third of your field before you have to take it back home and then charge it for six hours. So there are other factors to consider than just efficiency or just the availability of electricity. There are various factors to consider. One of them is the price of batteries. The bigger your vehicle is, the more expensive the batteries become. We see this in the construction sector where small construction equipment can be more cost competitive than its diesel equivalent. But as those pieces of equipment get bigger and bigger and bigger, the price of the batteries just inflates the total cost of the vehicle to such an extent it stops being cost effective. Um, people will argue where that break point is. In the past, I've said seven tons um, or, you know, maybe nine tons, maybe 12 tons you might get up to. We'll have to wait and see. Um, but that's kind of that's kind of the break point of where I, I see that it's cost effective to electrify versus it isn't. Again, assuming that you can recharge your batteries at the site where you need to recharge them, which is a big assumption in a lot of cases. Anyway, <clears throat> this graph here shows you the price of battery technology. Um, and as I said, over the past 10 years or so, 
we've got better and better at making them. The price has fallen significantly. You want to be careful looking at some of the assumptions that people take. A lot of people will put a linear trend on a graph like this and try to predict the price going forward that way. I don't know about you, but that doesn't look like a linear trend to me. I think that um, I don't know if we're at the minimum price for battery packs delivered, but I think we're getting close to it. I'm not sure how many more years we will keep getting significant price reductions. Obviously, market values fluctuate, so we want to get a few more years of data in there, but I would keep an eye on that. That doesn't look like a linear trend to me. The other thing when it comes to supply chains and infrastructure is making sure that the supporting infrastructure can actually be a cost-effective proposition. So I've got this hub and spoke model. We can talk about this either in terms of biomethane, for example, or in terms of hydrogen, it's slightly reversed for the two. If we take the biomethane example, up until now, a big hurdle for turning farm gas um, you know, the, the offtake from slurry pits, for example, into a usable fuel is the need to clean and upgrade that, that gas to a fuel quality standard that's suitable for use in a tractor. Um, taking that from the farm to a hub to process and then sending it back to the farm has been a very difficult proposition. So one of the arguments that's been put forward is that if you can find a number of farms in a location, they can deliver their um, farm gas to that hub for purification, upgrading to fuel. And if that hub has another significant uptake as well, maybe that's a factory that requires a certain amount of uh, methane to complete their, their operations, or perhaps another producer of um, gas in need of purification, such as a sewerage works, then you can perhaps start to make that make sense. We have recently got um, a trial going on in the UK. There's a company called Bannermans who have a biomethane um, mobile processing plant. As I understand it, they have six farms and they send this mobile processing plant around each farm and hopefully that will be cost effective. I think it's fair to him say that's a demonstration project that's underway. We don't know the results of that yet. And I don't know how often you will find six farms with exactly the right amount of offtake within a certain area to make that an application that you can roll out across the country, across Europe, internationally. I think that's part of the reason of doing the demonstration is to figure that stuff out. So it's definitely one to watch. It's really interesting. And then you've got to understand some of those economic factors of are the farms and the hub and the anchor load that you need to make it cost effective. Are they co-located close enough to make it worthwhile? And I've already touched on this a bit about charging electrical equipment. So I've talked a bit about how it is possible to get some electrical equipment to complete a significant amount of work if you're using small tractors, not too much land, lightweight. And it doesn't have to be all or nothing. You know, if you can do 20% of your workload with a 50 kilowatt small tractor or tally handler, then why not do that, right? That's a, that's Let's do that work and then save save the heavier tractors for the heavier work and we'll deal with those emissions later. That's a great suggestion. It's what you should definitely do. But there is a cost implication for putting the charging infrastructure in place. Forget the batteries, forget the tractor, actually putting the charging infrastructure in place, there is a cost implication. And we talk about the rate that you deliver power. So the bigger the battery is on your tractor and the faster you want to charge it, the more power, the more kilowatts you need to deliver in a given time. These are the 2020 costs on average for installing this equipment in the UK based on our experience from our infrastructure team. And it comes with five meters of electrical cable included in that price, which is not a lot. So to give you some context on that, we recently worked on a project where somebody wanted to put a 50 kilowatt charger in place, but it was about 100 meters away from the point where the main backbone was that they could connect to, to where they needed the charger to be. And the district network operators said they would come along and they would install that cable and connect it at both ends for 15,000 pounds. This was 2023 prices. But you need to understand that was just for them to turn up and put the cable in a trench that already existed. There, there was no involvement there in digging the trench. There was no involvement in negotiating access to land. If you don't own all the land between the cable where you need to connect to, 
and the and the point where you want to charge you've got to negotiate all that yourself and it doesn't include making good afterwards so if you've got to dig up a road at any point you've got to put that road back as well so none of those costs are included that's basically the cost for the copper cable in 2023 so it's not straightforward and this did not require an additional substation some some networks need to be reinforced you need more substations and then the cost becomes even greater again so again where you can electrify where you've got work that you can do and you can afford to put in place a battery tractor that of an appropriate size 75 kilowatts 100 kilowatts whatever it might be great do it but be aware of these other factors that can limit your adoption sometimes okay um a bit of a jump in topic here i'm still talking about the supply chain in general but this is just kind of stepping back a little looking at the wider environment as we're going forward we need to think about what's going to happen with technology where is it going to go and this particular map is from the apc this is their vision of where they think technology is going to change and how it's going to change i'm not going to read all this out to you because it's a bit involved but this is where they think it's gonna happen with off-highway equipment, which is kind of their closest definition of agricultural NRMM. Um, they haven't actually got a roadmap for that yet. Similarly, we see a similar roadmap. This one's from the Committee on Climate Change. Um, this one is, again, broken down into different categories of vehicles. Once again, they have kind of you know, failed to look at agriculture and non-road mobile machinery. But if we look at that, far right column in each of these categories. If you look at the HGV or the bus um, scenario, their prediction of the future is that there will only be hydrogen or battery electric new vehicles being sold in that time. So the question we have to ask ourselves is, as an agricultural sector, if everybody else is switching away from diesel, are we gonna be able to support the diesel infrastructure ourselves? Do you think that agricultural forestry and land use can maintain the diesel supply chain or a gas supply chain by itself i'm not sure that it can and what's going to happen for replacement parts in diesel engines as we move into this future how much is your head casket going to cost if agricultural sector and maybe a few mining vehicles and construction vehicles are the only ones actually buying head gaskets because they're all made by the same basic companies or they all have the same material feeds and they then supply into the tier one oems so yeah there is a whole thing to consider about as the world changes around us we will be forced to change with them and we need to be involved in that discussion and we need to come up with our own roadmap of what we think agricultural non-road machinery needs to be like and needs to be there and we need to have those conversations where people will say you know, we've done the research, we've done the maths, we need biomethane, we need electrification, and we need hydrogen, if that's what the if that's what the result turns out to be. And we need to make those arguments and say, here's where the demand is, here's where you need to build fuel infrastructure, and here's how you need to deliver it to our farms in the future if we're going to hit this net zero target. Okay. And on that topic, maybe you can help us. Our next project is with Northern Gas Networks, Working again with Ray's, it's come off the back of our um, Farm of the Future report again, and we're assessing the rural use case for hydrogen uh, on farms. So we're looking to understand the total energy demand on farms in Yorkshire. The argument is there's a lot of different types of farms in Yorkshire, therefore we can take our learnings from there and apply it across a wider environment. And we're going to make a bunch of what we're calling energy archetypes because we can't analyze every single farm individually. So we'll try and make a small number of types of farm, figure out a way of understanding and estimating their energy demand, and then try to understand this bit can go electric, this bit can go by methane, this bit's gonna to have to be something else. And then what will that something else be? Will it be hydrogen? Are we gonna to have to do something else? How are we gonna make that happen? So it's important that to develop these pathways and archetypes and hopefully come up with a, a a roadmap for this transition that we talk to people about their energy use on the farms so with a yorkshire focus again i'm not going to read all of this slide out you're welcome to read this later this is the the formal information that was put in place as part of the bid for winning this project but we want people that we can talk to 
about their energy use on their farms, whether that's, you know, um, heating, whether it's chicken farms, whether it's um, covered horticulture, whether it's um, dairy farms, whatever it is, anybody in the Yorkshire region who operates an agricultural business is valid. Anybody who supplies to that market, we want to talk to you. Anybody with knowledge and expertise that is applicable to that market, we want to talk to you, hopefully get you involved in our stakeholder program as well. And just to make people angry, if you don't talk to me, this is probably going to be how I'm going to do the archetypes because I've got to start somewhere. So the idea is I'm going to begin with this concept. We'll take it to the stakeholders and then they'll say, Nick, that's a stupid way to break up these energy demands. That's not the way it works. And then we go back and we change it again. And that's kind of the usual way we develop these energy scenarios with people's real world experience of how they actually use um, energy and fuel on their farms. And that's it. I've got to the end of my talk. Thank you very much for listening, folks. I think it's over to Q&A now. OK, thank you, Nick. Yeah, there's uh, plenty of questions, as you could imagine. The first one is dead simple. Is um, Somebody was asking if, if you potentially have a copy of the PowerPoint slide pack. I know we always it. Yeah, OK, so yeah. we can sort that out after. Um, so the first question is from Mr. Piggott about JCB's hydrogen development. Do you want to unmute yourself? No? Okay. Well, it, so basically, JCB's team intent on hydrogen as a fuel source. Are they right, is the question. Are they right? Are they right? <laughs> I think they're right. Yeah, I think, I think they're onto something. So if we look, they've looked at hydrogen for a good reason. Um, partly, they make internal combustion engines, right? That's a key part of their market. And they figured out that they can make hydrogen work in an internal combustion engine up to a certain size. Um, and they know the energy demands of their vehicles. So I don't know if they necessarily publish all this, but every kind of modern JCB vehicle, they know when the engine switched on, they know when it's working hard, they've got a rough idea of what it's doing. Um, and they're convinced that they can't meet the energy demand for the majority of their clients with batteries. And I think that's a fair assessment. So they need something else. Um, will it be hydrogen combustion by 2050? I don't know. Hydrogen fuel cells have the potential for significant um, price reduction, which I think is the main barrier. There is some talk of hydrogen fuel cells not being suitable due to vibration and dust. Um, I don't quite understand those arguments. The economic one makes perfect sense to me. Hydrogen fuel cells are expensive. Um, but the idea that, I mean, hydrogen fuel cells were developed by NASA because they're so good at resisting vibration. So the idea that they can't handle the vibration is strange to me. And one of the ways that we improve the performance of hydrogen fuel cells is we vibrate them. So the idea that the, they're prone to vibration doesn't quite stack up to me. Maybe it's not the fuel cell itself. Maybe it's some of the supporting supplementary plant around the fuel cell that's having the issue. But anyway, that didn't quite make sense. And again, as for the idea of the dust is a problem, I mean, JCB make great filters and install great filters on their equipment already. I don't quite get that. But the cost and delivery of hydrogen will be a hurdle. So can the technology work for certain sizes of equipment? Yeah, it absolutely can. Internal combustion of hydrogen can work. It's the supply chain and the cost of, this, of getting that hydrogen to the vehicle cost effectively is going to be the big problem. That said, there are dozens, maybe even hundreds of large scale hydrogen production projects being built as we speak. You know, pretty much, I would say 30% of the world's nations are looking at developing hydrogen supply chains as we speak, and that number is growing. So there is potential. Yeah, I think it's a question about are they right right now? Probably, yeah. Are they right in 20 years' time? Probably be something else, weren't it? I think, you know, somebody said a while back um, about if you burn anything, it's going to be a problem. So, you know, internal. So, I mean, yeah, so the, the if you're burning hydrogen, there will be some nitrous oxides emissions which contribute to um, air quality and um, global warming pollution. But according to JCB, and I haven't independently reviewed their results, they say that it is significantly lower than burning the diesel NOx, and obviously you don't have any CO2. When you burn mm. hydrogen, your main output is water, and you only get NOx if you're not burning it efficiently. 
and hydrogen is really good at burning efficiently as it happens. It's and making can, it not burn is the problem. And you so, can control the NOx. So. Yeah. So yeah, they again, they can probably make the technology work in the next five years. Can they make the supply chains for hydrogen work cost effectively in the next five years? I would be impressed if they manage that. Yeah. Um, so the next question is from me, um, and it's about the cost really of, of battery power. So I know that in sort of back in 2020, the cost for batteries was re sort of in the region of about £500 a kilowatt. Um, so if you had a 20 kilowatt machine, it was going to cost you 10 grand in batteries as a manufacturer um, versus maybe a couple of grand for an engine. Do you know how that figure changed? Because there was always a view that that would come down as the economies of scale went up. And I'm not so sure. Yeah, so been... I, I think we've seen that. So that graph I showed you yeah, I with the, yeah, the battery pack price, that's that's my best guide. So that, that battery pack price includes a lot of different types of batteries. So there's some noise in there. Um, so it includes static batteries. It includes car batteries. Um, but that's my go-to for understanding the cost per kilowatt hour of delivered battery packs. That's before the installation and putting it into the vehicle mm. and stuff like that. So that seems to be the best guide that we have. And then what's going to happen in the future? I mean, <clears throat> we've seen battery prices fall to a new low this year, but the reason they fall to a new low this year is because people have reduced the rate at which they're buying electric cars. Yes. So that's kind of a blip this year. I think we need a couple more years of data to sort of try and predict forward where that's going to be. And then there's always the novel technology thing, right? People are working on all sorts of different battery chemistries. People talk about solid state batteries. I think you need to take some of that with a pinch of salt. Solid state is hard to do. It's really difficult to do in terms of manufacturing processes. Um, but then we have the, the, sodium, the sodium batteries. I think in China, they started putting sodium ion batteries on the road in vehicles. I never thought I'd see that in my lifetime. So, you know, the technology is moving and it's worth keeping an eye on this stuff. But yeah, the uh, the the graph that I showed is my best prediction to answer that question. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so next question from uh, Niall Dillon. I'm, I'm happy to. Okay. So Niall Dillon asks, um, Battery electric vehicles and fuel cell electric vehicles are technologically unique and usually quite a bit more expensive than what is on the market for traditional internal combustion engines. How can we ensure that farms are not impacted by both increased purchase price and reduced in-house serviceability? It seems like at the moment legislation for decarbonisation is coming into place significantly before the price of zero emission products match traditional internal combustion engine machines on the market currently. I would agree that is an issue. Um, so at the moment, we use internal combustion engine vehicles because diesel's cheap and there's no fee to us for using the atmosphere as an open sewer. We can dump as much carbon dioxide into it as we want as we're driving along, and it's you know there's no cost to us for that. Battery electric vehicles for passenger cars are according to advocates who support this knowledge who support this they're due to hit cost parity with passenger cars in the next few years on a total cost of ownership basis so you know as long as you're driving more than pick a number as long as you're doing your ten thousand miles a year or more the actual operational cost of that versus the the increased purchase price at the beginning the the capital expenditure cost at the beginning of the purchase of the vehicle should actually work out cheaper in the long run so we would hope to see something equivalent in battery electric sector in the agriculture as well so you might pay a bit more for your 50 75 kilowatt little electric tractor to begin with and you might pay a bit more for the infrastructure but you know if you keep that tractor going for five years and you work it hard enough you will save enough money especially with a few solar panels on your um on your shed somewhere you'll save enough money that it's worth your while doing that um Will we see a similar cost down for fuel cells? It is possible. Um, you know, a big part of the way that battery technology reduced in price was the building of these gigafactories. It was the building of this, you know, massive scale production of batteries specifically for the automotive market. If somebody invests in something similar for fuel cells, if we see, you know, 20 or 30 gigawatt 
fact, giga, giga, yeah, gigawatt factories for fuel cells being built around the world, we could see a significant drop in their price. Will it bring it to the point of price parity with diesel? Hard to know. Maybe it might be possible. It might be possible. Will we ever get hydrogen down? So hydrogen is a funny thing. I can tell you now today for, so for example, we take something like a refuse collection vehicle as an example. With the subsidies that are available today, if you buy a hydrogen powered, hydrogen fuel cell powered rubbish truck, and if you can fill it up at the dispenser for about £5.50 a kilo of hydrogen, the total cost of ownership of that vehicle will be about the same as a diesel. Okay, we've done the maths, we've done the research, we've done this project multiple times. That's about where it's at. If you don't have the subsidies, it'll have to be even less, £4.50, say, in that order, maybe maybe £4. So that's the break point for hydrogen. If you can if you can squirt hydrogen into your hydrogen vehicle before you drive it off to go and do a bit of work, at around about that, you know, four pounds, six pounds mark, that's where you start to be at the same total cost of ownership price with a diesel equivalent. But just to put this in context, I think the 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 dispenser price for most hydrogen is like 15 or 19 pounds at the moment you know so we need a significant increase in the supply of hydrogen we need a significant increase in the supply of hydrogen fuel cells there's a whole supply chain to be built and will it ever be more cost effective or as cost effective as ice i mean i hope so i want it to be i haven't seen evidence to say that it will for sure yet there are predictions that say that it will that's the best answer i can give you to that one Okay, thank you. Hello, Tim Chairman, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, H hello, Nick. Uh, can you hear me all right? Yes, thank you. Yeah, um, in, in the graphic you showed uh, of all the things going on on farms, you, you mentioned no till and autonomous vehicles as a means of reducing compaction to soils. Um, have you in your studies considered the use of controlled traffic farming as a means of reducing compaction? Because this is a this is a win-win system, and it produces both input emissions, both on-farm and pre-farm, but in the form of, of diesel machinery use and operating costs, as well as cutting emissions from soil. So it's got a, a tremendous amount to offer in terms of cutting emissions overall. Yeah, absolutely. So that so that is something that we've discussed in the raise report. It is something that we've looked at a little. We have not worked on that as a project yet, as Senex. So I've been involved in projects where I've reported on it as a lit as a literature review exercise, um, but I've not actually been involved in measuring that um, directly yet. It is something that, you know, we see something similar in the construction sector as well, where you have anything where you have machine control, where you have that ability to um, take out some of the human variability and optimize your systems. We do see significant fuel reduction. Um, and that is a great step that we should take. And, you know, if you can reduce that energy demand, that increases the um, number of sectors where batteries might become apl applicable. It also, you know, it increases the number of sectors where, you know, hydrogen might become applicable as well. Because um, it's, it's a less, it's a less easy to store fuel than diesel. It's hard to pack as much energy into a tractor with hydrogen as you can with diesel. Yeah, yeah if, if you want to point it to any, um, um, publications then uh, I, I could well be able to help on that point I'll, I'll i'll next time next time i'm looking at that i will absolutely be glad to do so and feel free to just email them to me anyway um, we have okay. a knowledge repository at work and i i have a folder of topics that i i save links into for the future so yeah if you want to send me some links i'm happy to receive those and i think my email is in the presentation so okay will do <laughs> thank, Lovely, thank you thank you Okay, uh, next question or two questions from Mark Andrews. You want to unmute yourself, Mark? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, we hear you. Very good. So this is about uh, supply of electricity. Um, so I've got a, a couple of questions. Um, one is that, um, well, firstly, I'm not sure I agree with you about battery and battery swap exchange. Um, underground mining haul trucks and wheel loaders are around uh, available battery swap with 50 ton payloads. So it's technology under the earth that's happening with battery 
um, and above ground with uh, non-battery swap, uh, current earth moving machinery from Volvo and from China are offering battery electric wheel loaders and excavators of over 20 ton size now, commercially. So it's all down to the machine working profiles and that demand for electricity to keep them running, which you you commented on. How do you see that our national grid developing to support agriculture, industrial and domestic use for these battery electric vehicles? So there is a um, cost effectiveness issue um, at play here. So there is a big ask to expect um, electricity suppliers to put in place, you know, sufficient charging infrastructure for um, 150 kilowatt charge rates um, at every single farm. I don't think that's going to be effective. So I, I, unless we're going to subsidize that as a nation, which I don't see any evidence that the British people want to do that at the moment, we're going to have to come up with another solution. Now, at the moment, the solution we use is diesel because it's it works really well. So that indicates to me that we're probably going to need another mole molecule based fuel. Will that be biomethane? Will it be hydrogen? Will it be like e-methanol or uh, what's the other one? Ammonia. You know, all of these things are being considered. Um, you could put 10 different consultants in a room and ask this question. You'll get 10 different <laughs> answers as to which one's going to be right. I think we're heading towards a fuel mix future. I think from an agricultural point of view, electric where you can, you know, if you've got a wind farm and you can, and you've got a solar panels or you can, some way of generating power on your own land, all the more power to you, no pun intended, and you'll be able to electrify further and deeper than other people will. Um, if you have crops that are extremely energy intensive and have very narrow turnarounds between, you know, um, harvesting one one section of land and then uh, preparing the land for it for the next crop and putting in the next crop in a very short window of time doing that through a battery electric system even with battery swapping i, I just don't see how it's going to be possible when you do, when you crunch the numbers on the how are you going to get your battery swap equipment to the field where you need it you're gonna to have to drive your tractor back every time you need to swap battery i just don't see it working you could have a diesel powered battery swap system turn up to the field that might be more effective but yeah i think we're going to come for a molecular solution i did my my university time in hydrogen so i'm a hydrogen fan but like i say you could have a biomethane guy here and they'll tell you biomethane will do it you could have an e-fuels uh, person here and they'll tell you that you know you can do it all with ammonia or e-methanol or whatever so yeah predicting how that's going to come out i don't know um my money's on hydrogen but then i have my own biases yeah and um, thank you very much for that um just fyi i noticed a couple of independent battery power packs being marketed into construction machinery for remote powering of smaller electric earth moving machinery um yeah. the next question is really on hbo fuel and where's it going to come from and how are we going to avoid deforestation and the negative yeah aspect. yeah absolutely so i mean so hvo is um, it's made from vegetable oil for those of you who don't know hydrogenated vegetable oil um in an ideal scenario that is reclaimed or recycled vegetable oil um that is made into the fuel uh, but there have been reported incidences of people using virgin oil to make fuel because it's cheap it's more profit to make the fuel and sell it as fuel than it is to sell it as cooking oil. So yeah, it's a problem. We have certification schemes, you know, how robust are those certification schemes? How much time and effort do we want to put into that, into policing those supply chains? I think that's, that's part of the argument that we need to make. We need to step up and say, I, okay, I'll put HVO in my tractor. And the fact that it's blendable, right? You don't have to do a hundred percent HVO. You could carry on using diesel and, you know, if you can if you can get 20% of your diesel demand from certified renewably sourced HVO, go ahead and do that. Right, that's great. That's that reduces your emissions profile overall. Um, but yeah, it's it's investigating the certification schemes, making sure they're robust, and like speak speak to our lawmakers. 
you know, make sure that we are putting pressure on our MPs to have in place robust supervision and regulation on the supply of HVO and biofuels. That would be my answer to that. I did, I did put in the chat, actually, there's a government call for evidence on non-road mobile machinery. So it's in the link is in the chat, so anybody can fill that in. Uh, so obviously, yeah. a lot of organisation companies, professional bodies are all putting evidence in to support that. Uh, we've probably got time for one more question. We'll, we'll skip a couple of questions, uh, which I think have pretty much been covered. So the last question is from Philip Pinn. I know his microphone isn't plugged in, so I shall read it out. Um, as agricultural vehicles can have a longer lifespan than anything on the road. Has there been any work into life cycle impacts of ice versus battery versus gas fueled? Taking out the financial aspects of having a new tractor on farm, it seems to me that impacts are minimized by not putting the resources into manufacturing something new and scrapping something old, even if the older vehicle is dirtier. Not practical for all farming businesses I know. Okay. So, uh, short answer is yes, people have looked at the life cycle analysis of these powertrains. Um, another shout out for Senex. Our Senex Netherlands team are particularly good at life cycle analysis. If you need a life cycle analysis team, they're the guys to go for. Um, so, there's a funny thing. So, a lot of this data that I'm about to talk about now, I think, comes more from the construction and mining equipment. There is some data that applies to agriculture, but I don't have as robust an understanding of that sector. So apologies in advance. I'm making, I'm, I'm extrapolating a little bit. One of the things that we see is as vehicles age, their actual real world use reduces. So, you know, you got your brand new tractor. That's the one you jump into to go and do a job. You don't, you don't jump into the, the 35 year old one that sometimes starts and, um, you know, doesn't keep you warm when it's cold. So we find that those smaller track, those older tractors, sorry, tend to have much reduced working profiles. They're not out for 12 hour days at any point. Um, that's the first thing. So in terms of their impact on emissions, they are less important than changing over the new tractors. Okay. So that's, that's the first point on that in terms of, you know, are we going to have a whole legacy fuel fleet, old vehicles, which we still need to fuel and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, we absolutely will. I think that's where the long-term future of HVO might be personally. I think, you know, classic cars, some specialist vehicles, there are some really strange bits of kit out there that, you know, have been kept running for 30 years because they do a very unique and bespoke job. We're not going to, we're not going to rebuild those until we absolutely have to. So I think that's going to be a key market for HVO in the long term. Um, in terms of, I'm trying, I'm trying to find the question. There was a third party question, which I'd forgotten, sorry. Um, yeah, so minimizing the inputs. Yeah, there is there is a very strong case for keeping a bit of kit going. There, it's, there is a bit of a switch over where you need to kind of understand, you know, I've just bought a brand new diesel. It doesn't make sense to um, turn that into an electric you know, you need to get the value out of that embedded carbon and everything in that vehicle for sure. Once it's paid its debt, you then kind of, if you're putting it to one side and you're not using it consistently, then it's probably okay to kind of leave it sitting there and use it for those odd jobs where you need. If you are trying to use an older vehicle consistently, economically and environmentally, again, I'm extrapolating a little bit from um, HGVs, refuse collection vehicles, and some construction equipment here. I haven't done this study on tractors, but I would assume the same thing. If you're trying to make a 10-year-old tractor work eight hours a day, I'm willing to bet that you'll be um, better off from both a carbon footprint point of view and probably from a fuel efficiency point of view. And the amount of work you'll get done for you switching to a newer vehicle. Maybe it's not 10 years, maybe it's 12. But newer vehicles tend to be more efficient, more comfortable to operate. And you, know, you will save fuel, you'll save energy. You'll be able to use um, automated systems that you can't use at the moment. So there is tends to be a switchover point where you don't want to be using those older vehicles full time anymore. It's it's better business sense and better for the environment to switch to the new ones. Well, that exact age, exact age is is harder for me to say. There you go. How's that? Well, thank you, Nick, for giving us an excellent presentation and taking the time out of your schedule to do so today. It's very much appreciated.
Uh, hopefully everybody found that really interesting. It's always a good source of debate, future fuels. So um, hopefully people found that thought, thought provoking. I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today and hope you will join us for our next lecture on the 16th of April, where we'll be joined by Paul Harris from Real Success. We'll be talking about interviews. So hopefully that will be interest, uh, of interest to students. So all that's left to say is thanks again and we'll see you next time. Bye bye.